Were the plays a trick or a treat? We saw a couple of plays at 5090's 59th Street. The first one, Drew Gilchrist and I saw Trick or Treat, and this is Drew's version. My version you can read on Facebook. Trick or Treat, a family dramedy by Jack Neary, takes place in a suburb of Boston on Halloween night. The patriarch Johnny, convincingly performed by Gordon Clapp, is a feisty sexagenarian who lives in a comfortable home impeccably designed by Michael Ganeo and is caretaker to his wife Nancy suffering Alzheimer's disease. While proudly passing out oversized candy to the neighborhood children, he is perplexed and anxious over a grave incident and summons his daughter Claire to his home. They are visited by Hannah, the pushy, nosy neighbor who is determined to get to the bottom of a mystery. And David Mason is hot-headed Teddy, the local cop who is also Johnny's son, arrives with a hidden agenda of his own. Um, part soap opera, part sitcom, part Agatha Christie, Trick or Treat has a difficult time finding its center. Although a capable cast tackles inconsistencies and belabored scenes, director Carol Dunn has done an, an exemplary task of maintaining credibility despite the questionable circumstances. The trick to this production doesn't yield the treat deserved, and he gives it an unhappy face, as do I, which you will see. And... Drew is much nicer than me. On Blueberry Hill is one of the greatest plays I have seen recently. And this writer, Sebastian Barry, is like, I cannot compare him with anyone else, but, you know, like maybe Eugene O'Neill or Shakespeare. He is so, his writing is so melodious. It's so magical. This play is about two men who are in prison in the same cell. And their story unfolds in a very tragic, but a magical way, and then we find out why they are in prison. Uh, the play is done precisely, beautifully, minimalist set, focused lighting, great language. I mean, if anybody wants to go see a play with the most beautiful writing, go see Sebastian Barry's on we, Blueberry Hill. We should explain that th these plays are done in alternating monologues. And we hear about their early life. We hear a lot about them so that we are very sympathetic to them before we find out what they actually did. So we look, can look at them more favorably when we do find out. And I'm not a fond person of monologues. Usually they put me to sleep. But like you say, it was just so riveting. And you were so mesmerized by these brilliant actors and, and the way the light just focused on them. And it, it, it was just like... Really? Yeah, it's like you, you, you know, the thing is, it was, it was so, I mean, it's a tragic story, but it is so riveting. It's like I'm repeating your word again and again. But it is just so fantastic that you sit like this and every second you are absorbed with the story, and, which is very painful. And yeah, and the, 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 the question is, is forgiveness and redemption possible? I guess it is possible. In this well, play, it, yeah, you know, well, you know, the that, audience decides yeah. because you know it's all done ve very cut and dry, you know, almost unemotional, almost, uh, almost unemotional, and but, it's but, like, but it, it raises emotions in you. Yeah, it's a one so, long dramatic monologue divided in many, many sections. One person speaks, and the other person speaks, and it's a brilliant technique. And I, Eva doesn't like long monologues, but I, I, like I love long monologues. And I saw one of his plays in London a long time ago. Uh, Stuart of Christendom, and it started with the longest possible monologue, and I said, I'm in business. <laughs> <laughs> I love this play. So, and yes, this so we agree. Sebastian Barry, go see on Blueberry Hill. Leslie DeLeo and I saw Wickedest Woman, and this is mostly Leslie's review, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Jessica Bashline's Wickedest Woman is an absorbing, gracefully performed production based on the real life of Anne Lohman, a woman who sold contraceptive drugs and performed then-legal abortions in New York between the mid-1830s through the 1870s. A working midwife, Anne cared deeply for women's health and understood the frustration, danger, and lack of freedom that women suffered through constant pregnancies. Her own mother back in England had been constantly pregnant and suffered the loss of some of her children as well as her own health. Anne was determined to make the world a better place for women, many of whom had become pregnant through the abuse of their employers or pimps or customers. 
And I mean, and her first husband died, but her second husband was very good at marketing and they had this catalog and they would sell it all over the place, all these different powders and pills that would help, you know, stop pregnancies or help with all sorts of things. And she became so rich that she, she owned a place on Fifth Avenue. And all the elements of the show are excellent. The script, acting, singing, choreography, music, and direction. And the set is multifunctional, and some of the action is inspired. Jessica O'Hara Baker's Anne is appropriately driven, compassionate, intelligent, fierce, and earthly, while Jose Maria Aguilas Charles, that's her second husband, is passionate as Anne's husband and intellectual partner. Wicked as Women is a timely production that from the very beginning homes in on the price women are paid for not having control over their own reproductive health. And I just love learning about people I don't know anything about. This woman, she was called Madame Ristel. She had a place on, on Greenwich Avenue. I mean, she was arrested, a you know, because they were, the men, they're the reason they made abortion illegal because they were mad at a woman getting all this business and becoming rich because they were like, how dare this woman do this? So, I mean, the two of us were just fascinated by this. And, I mean, I cannot recommend this enough. You are going to have to see a great play, learn a lot. And the way the ensemble goes from male to female and the costumes, everything brilliant. At Theater for a New Audience in Brooklyn, you could see Calvin Trilling's play about Alice, which is really a very loving portrait of his marriage to Alice, which lasted from 1965 till her death in 2001. Um, it includes some very funny scenes, like we're uh, at a party um, where he's trying to get her interested in him. He's telling all these ridiculous stories about <laughs> animals and getting her to agree to visit this mythical creature at the Bronx Zoo. Um, but later it becomes very serious when at age 38, she, who is a non-smoker, got lung cancer and was determined to beat the odds, which would have been only 10% of survival. But because she was so dedicated to her family, her two daughters, um, and miraculously, she did survive. Um, she's quite a good writer in her own right and um, had, had done a lot of writing about cancer to um, sort of support other cancer victims and survivors. It's a very wonderful play. It's a two-character play. The woman who plays Alice, which is, um, what's her name? Um, Carrie Pfaff gets to wear a lot of great costumes, while Calvin Trillin, who's more, um, he, he talked about their relationship as being a sitcom like the George Burns, Gracie Allen show, where she was the George Burns because she was the more serious one, and he was kind of goofy. <laughs> um, it makes the marriage maybe a little bit too perfect, but the writing is so good, the performances are so good, even a curmudgeon like me could enjoy it. Happy face. Elevator Repair Service has brought back their gats, this time to the Skirball Center. And Bina and I have been wanting to see this for absolute years, so you can imagine our excitement. We're finally getting to see it. Okay, guys. Be aware, they are reading the entire S. Scott Fitzgerald Great Gatsby from beginning to end. It takes eight hours. You get two, in, two intermissions. You do get an hour and a half dinner break. And I love S. Scott Fitzgerald. He's one of my favorite writers. I love The Great Gatsby. So for me, this was pure heaven. So it, the way they have set it up, they're like in this office. And the guy's computer isn't working. And he discovers the great Gatsby and starts to read it out loud. And other office workers are drifting back and forth doing office workery things, sorting through mail. And there's an old-fashioned typewriter there. And, and then eventually they all turn into the characters and they take over the voices. But there's still the narrator because Nick is a narrator. And he does the he said, she said, and every little thing. Thing is used. My only complaint is because I love the text so much, some of the sound effects were just so loud they drowned out the text. Because I could listen to this no problem for eight hours because I just love this book so much. I mean, I don't know for someone who's never seen it how they would feel about it, but oh my gosh, you know, I was just crying and just 
sucks. And 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 you leave afterwards, and you're like so surprised to be outside in the real world, like because you're in this world of the 1920s. Oh, and I should give the plot. You know, you see the thing is this like, I. I was so excited to see this play and I was a little sick, so I was like really having, trying to have extra energy. And in the very beginning, uh, Nick, the character, Scott Shepard, s starts the reading a bit slowly. And I was like, I was like, oh my God, do I have to watch this for eight hours? But I realized very soon, this man is gonna read till 10 p.m., you know? <laughs> and amazing how he did it. And I said it in my review, uh, that is a monumental idea. Whoever thought of doing this whole book, I mean, he doesn't miss a comma or he doesn't miss nothing. So I'm on, I was going to go into the plot because yeah. I was so excited to set it up, I forgot to go into the plot. So Nick is a narrator. He is this guy from the Midwest, and he's, you know, middle upper middle class. He comes to New York in the, you know, 20s to make his living with stocks and bonds and Daisy is his second cousin and he meets Jordan the golf champion there and Daisy is married to this brute of a bully guy racist disgusting horrible person Tom oh, who's, wonderful got a, actor. who's got a blousy mistress and the mistress's husband is hoping Tom will sell him his car he's just this little pathetic guy who runs a garage and Jay Gatsby has bought, he's, he, nobody knows where he came from or what he does. His rumors circulate about this man, but he throws these amazing parties in his mansion. And Nick is living in a little tiny bungalow sandwiched in all this extravagance, this little $80 a month bungalow. And him and Gatsby become friends because Gatsby has a thing for Daisy, who is the cousin of Nick. And it's this whole romantic thing of Gatsby, who met Daisy before he went to the war and has always been in love with her and hopes to win her back and will he win her back. And, and what about Tom, this brute of a husband? And just the two, it's just really, I love the story. It's just, you see, can you, can you imagine like the way she described this in the book? Can you imagine doing a play out of it when you have seen a couple of movies about Great Gatsby with the lavish sets and the pools and the mansions and the costumes and the jewels and everything? And you're sitting in this, the office, the, the set is very mundane, it's very ordinary. People, they come in, they walk in here and there picking up papers, wearing these buttoned up ties and shirts and all that. They look very undramatic and everything. And then it slowly, this starts unfolding and you are just like the whole story comes to you you know I've seen the movies and every scene becomes real you forget the swimming pool. because you know you it was very clever the way they did do that uh, who is it let's see the director is John Collins the the way that the fact is that they did it like in the beginning no character not just him yeah. reading it lets your imagination take yes. over. Like your imagination yeah. has to do the work. Your imagination is creating the sets and scenery, and the language is so beautiful. It's so perfect that it just like. And sometimes you're just swooning over the language, so that when people finally do pop in, it's almost incidental because you your brain has already gone into this other world, and you're hearing the words, but your brain and your imagination is no is not there, not even in the author. You know, you see the thing is this. Is it reconfirms my belief in the great words and great actors. And then no set and no scenery and no props are necessary, okay? Only the bad plays, they have a lot of props and things like that. I mean, this director could have said, oh, it's not gonna work because we don't have the pool, we're gonna have the mansion, how is gonna make the tea party, how are we gonna do all that? No, they thought about it, they sat down, they did it. I'm sure it was a lot of rehearsal time and a lot of hard work. Well, this has also been been produced for years. They've been doing this. Yeah. And I also want to mention, just to show you how good this was, every other time they've attempted this with um, Sound and the Fury and I think The Sun Also Rises, some Hemingway story, I hated it. I do not like them. I do not like elevator wow. repair service. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. But this was phenomenal. You because you also love the writer. You I love think Scott because Spitzer. I love yeah. that I did not even care about every now and then they do some weird thing like throw papers in the air or, or do yeah. something odd. And that's the other thing that he brought up was a lot of the humor. I mean you were laughing and you were totally your my, my mind never wandered for yeah, except it, for where the story you see, me to wander. The thing is just like it's a it, the, the productions we have seen in the movies oh, yeah. are very very lavish. But the story is a very sad story because at the end you <laughs> No, 
You do that. You want, she tried oh. to spoil it in there too, and, you right. all, okay. and an audience oh, member oh, got oh. mad at you. Oh, okay. So let, let right. come all on. Right. Enough. Okay. Okay. All right. I, th I think they gather that we enjoyed this. Yeah, we enjoyed thoroughly. Yeah. And also, I have to say one more thing. I I watched the audience. And they had such concentration I haven't seen in 2018 mm. or 17 or 19 because they're always on their phones. And they were listening to this fantastic reading and the writing and the acting. And I said, oh, man, this, this, this kind of stuff has to happen most of the time so people can get rid of their digital instruments. I love this play. Our new reviewer, Jacob Goldboss, got to see Barefoot, which was written by Kate T. Billingsley and Thomas Waits, directed by Thomas G. Waits. And it concerns Sylvia, whose friend, her girlfriend Teddy, has been sleeping with Sylvia's fiancé, Robert. Uh, Teddy also has a fiancé, Mark, who it seems like they're in an abusive relationship. And most of the play is a... Uh, party scene where the four of them, I guess, are having a rather uncomfortable party, but <laughs> involving drugs, which might make it easier. And then a pizza man named Chet comes for comic relief. This is a play that uh, Goldboss felt was an excellent commentary on the relationships in the 21st century. It clearly articulates the limits of openness between two couples, and he gave it a happy face plus. More on Facebook. Tada is bringing us Janine, Nina Trevins and Deidre Broderick's Odd Day Rain, which is a dystopian world where kids on the outside are trying to survive on what little water they get when the computer allows rain to happen only every other day. Aurora is convinced that inside the cave where the computer lives, there is another human being. She also thinks she can reprogram the computer to provide more rain. Some of the other kids scoff at her and others encourage her. Aurora finally braves the cave and discovers Claire there, who only knows what the computer tells her and provides for her. When Claire goes into the outside with Aurora, she is totally out of her element. To her, laughing and saying, LOL, can either one survive with or without the computer? This is a very clever way to show the perils of being attached to technology. People are more important than virtual friends. Once again, Tada showcases talented kids who can sing, dance, and tell a darn good story. Happy face. And Jacob Goldboss saw another play, Echo Village, written by Phoebe Neer, directed by Chloe Treat. And this is going on at St. Clement's Theater in Hell's Kitchen. And it involves a, a farm commune where a woman from the city, Robin, um, goes to seek refuge from her life, which is in bad shape because of drugs and stuff. She meets Jake, who is a, um, um, I guess he's a carpenter, a construction person, and they have a relationship. There's also a kleptomaniac who visits the camp. And uh, he says that it puts questions of idealism under the microscope. The optimistic takeaway from this production is one doesn't have to leave the city to solve the problems of life. Uh, he felt it was quite good. Again, happy face with more on Facebook. Went to the opening of musicals in Mufti and saw Carmelina and talked to some of the actors and musical people involved. Andrea Burns and Carmelina for musicals in Mufti. Yes. Have you known this musical before? No, I just uh, came to know it just a few weeks ago and fell in love with it. It's a gorgeous score by Burton Lane and Alan J. Lerner, and uh, I've fallen in love. I know, it is a best score, but the story is kind of iffy. Do you want to tell us delicately about the story? Well, this is the story of a woman who um, made the best decision she could to make sure her daughter had a legitimate name despite the truth of uh, her daughter's birth. I kind of feel, I feel bad. I mean, so you were basically 17 years all alone, American soldiers stormed through, yes. and yet you're considered like, you know, the, the naughty woman when they're the ones that were really, you know, I mean, in our, well, I, in our, I let them in the door and I let them stay, you know. But uh, she, was, she was a woman who was lonely and, and it's very clear that the three of them were loving and kind, and uh, she took advantage of the situation. In the end, she wasn't taken advantage of. I think she took advantage and then made the most of it. 
I always feel bad, though. See, like, 17 years go by letting her suitor wait for her. I mean, how, you know, after having such a wonderful experience at 17, to go 17 years without having something like that again, I mean, I was wondering, how does she manage? She's a mother. Anything for her daughter. I think that's the, the bottom line. Here we are with Joey Sorge. And what did you do with, uh, you, oh, you played Vittorio. Vittorio della Marte, yes. Oh, my goodness, you have a great accent. Thank you very much. I'm Italian, so it comes naturally. <laughs> you, you're so loyal to be in love with a woman for 17 years. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it is, uh, I, I'm just now starting to enjoy that. You know, we've only done four performances, and so every show it's becoming more and more, uh, uh, visceral for me. Yeah, gosh, this score is beautiful. I mean, I, you know, when I heard the album, I, I wasn't really sure about the score because I was more intimidated by the operatic uh, quality of, of the music. But then when I started hearing all the other songs, I was blown away about how beautiful it is. It really is a beautiful score. It's nice because you're sort of the tour guide and you show off the town and you're like the every man. Yeah, yeah, I am, you know, and, but, but he's also funny and charming and, and, and he's, he's in love. So, yeah. This is a love song. There's a story about a love song. It is. It's time for a love song. It's time for a love song, exactly. And I, well, I hear that's one of uh, Sondheim's favorite songs. That's what I heard. Here we are with... Hey, David Hancock Turner, music director and pianist of Carmelina. I don't know exactly about how contemporary it was, but the lyrics were redone um, in six songs by Barry Harmon. He updated the lyrics in some cases and there's also one new song that he wrote with Burton Lane. So it's sort of a mashup of Alan J. Lerner and Barry Harmon lyrics to sort of come up with a brand new show that's quite, from what we've heard, sort of unlike the 1979 production. So hopefully it has that. Those original songs are still the same. A lot of them are the same. Someone in April, One More Walk Around the Garden, but then a lot of the other ones are sort of updated in a way. It's just a really fun piece. The music is beautiful. The lyrics are great, they're smart, and the book is, I think, particularly tight and fun. Oh. Barry Harmon. So you had the, I don't know, it was enviable or unenviable task of sprucing up Carmelina for the 2019 sensibility. There's one song on the show that uh, I redid, uh, it was called Love Before Breakfast, if you know the score, and we turned it to Love Me Tomorrow. Uh, and originally it was a song for the male lead, and we gave it to the female lead. And when we first played it for Alan, he actually started to cry. Because he was a very sentimental character. And we cry at his own shows all the time. And I, I said, did we do something wrong? He said, no. He said, I was stuck on that moment. I never knew what to do with it. And you guys nailed it. Which was, to me, incredibly one of my happiest memories in terms of writing. I think it's in terms of Alan and um, Burton's collaboration. One More Walk Around the Garden, I think, is the pinnacle of what they did. I just think it's such a gorgeous song. And it's also a very personal song for Alan, um, because his last relationship, uh, his wife, who was here this bad day, uh, Liz Robinson, I'm not saying he was for her, but that's what he was looking for in his life, is one, one more chance, one more, to fall in love one more time. I forget how many wives he had, but it was quite a few. And, uh, you know, he's fairly old when he was writing it. So he finally got it right with the last one. It's a lovely lady. And she came, she had never seen the show. And so we were nervous because, you know, she's part of the, uh, the estate and they have to approve the show going forward. So um, she actually loved it. And she said, Hello, here we are with Jim Stanek. In Carmel. It's a great score, but it's also, it's, it's just a light, lovely tale. It's genuine people. And it's about love, and it's about family, and and it's about uh, the the long-lasting love. It's 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 about lifetime love. So loyalty. Loyal. There you go. That, I was I was looking for one other L word, and that's it. And it's it is it's a, this loyal love that lasts for so long. Um, and I don't think we see enough of that. It's and the charms of small town life. Yes. Which. Not everybody lives in New York City. We, we, there, are, there are small towns out there, and yes, it's it's this kind of sweet, genuine little thing that sort of, I think when you come, it's infectious. So that's why it, that's why it keeps getting done because it, it, it sort of demands to be done.
it, it just makes you feel good. It, it just does, you know. And, it, and it, it's nice, you know. Sort of the the, the ending isn't sort of resolved, so everyone kind of feels they have their own happy ending. The characters. Oh sure, but and I well, I can't top that. Basically, Carmelina is about an incident that happened during World War II with three soldiers, and it comes back to haunt Carmelina in her small Italian town 20 years later. Leslie and I went to see Anne of Green Gables, The Royal Family, put on part one, featuring Ali Ewald and four dancers telling about that red-haired orphan girl that comes to Prince Edward Island and wins the heart of of everyone around her. You'll find the entire review on Facebook and this is where you can find the plays that we saw. This review will end up on Facebook. And I just found out Marlena Vega, uh, Raven Snook's daughter, plays the computer. And Scott Siegel's got some great stuff at 54 Below. And Richard Skipper celebrates February 10th at 1 o'clock at the West Bank, and that's always a fun show. Encores is back with Call Me Mad, and Break a Leg is doing The King's Face. Uh, Lynn Nottage will be talking to Elizabeth Venticelli for free. Clyde Barnes uh, Awards, February 11th. 90 Seconds CY has tons of stuff. Just go to their website. Running out of time, so all this important information I talk about will show up on our Facebook page. So go there to find out all the cool stuff going on. Also coming up at the Paper Mill Playhouse is The British Invasion, which is about Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits. And I'm going to have an interview with him on our next show, February 16th. So go to Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey. It's got all the 60s music that you know and love. I'm seeing Between the Threads it here on February 3rd. We'll talk about these on our next show. And these are shows that close. We didn't get before the show, so you can read them. Uh, parody production. Don't forget to pick up your performing arts inside the cultural heartbeat of New York City. Our next show is February 16th. Thank you to Amy Fishman who filmed at Carmelina for us. And don't forget, you can also go to YouTube, Eva Heinemann, to see the show there. It's all archived. Uh, Twitter and Facebook and 